Today's podcast is going to be a little bit different from the other podcasts in this series. The lesson material is on Jacob chapters 1 through 4, where, of course, we find Jacob's sermon to the Nephites, specifically the Nephite men, where he focuses on virtue, he focuses on chastity, and the dangers and the sins that had come among the Nephite nation. And as I was preparing for this lesson, I just felt strongly like I should share some of my story and the things that have been beneficial to me in this area. This is a little bit vulnerable to me. I've never really talked about this subject too much publicly. And uh, so if you'll bear with me, I want to share some things that are close to my heart in the hope that someone listening will be able to be helped by this. I just want to start off with a prophecy that President Joseph F. Smith made uh, during his life. He said, quote, There are at least three dangers that threaten the church within, and the authorities need to awaken to the fact that the people should be warned unceasingly against them. As I see these, they are the flattery of prominent men in the world, false educational ideas, and sexual impurity, end quote. The prophet Joseph Smith made a similar prophecy during his life where he told the members of the Quorum of the Twelve when they were first organized that, quote, the elders of Israel and particularly the Twelve Apostles would receive more temptations, be more buffeted, and have greater difficulty to escape the evil thrown in their way by females than by any other means. Of course, he's referring to morality and chastity here. This is one of Satan's most powerful auxiliaries with which to weaken the influence of the ministers of Christ and bring them down from their high position and calling into darkness, shame, and disgrace. You will have to guard more strictly against that than against any other evil that may beset you. Make up your mind not to yield for one moment to the subtle insinuations of the animal propensities of your natures while you are absent on the Lord's errands, end quote. In the book of Jacob, Jacob warns that it was immorality that was one of the significant, if not the primary contributor to the downfall of the Nephites. In chapter 3, verse 3, he says, Woe, woe unto you that are not pure in heart, that are filthy this day before God. For except ye repent, the land is cursed for your sakes. And the Lamanites, which are not filthy like unto you, nevertheless, they are cursed with a sore cursing. They will scourge you even unto destruction. Now, in this podcast, I'm going to speak as a young, single adult member of the church. I'm not married, uh, even though I have seen some of the funniest and craziest rumors, especially online, as our family kind of moved into the spotlight, challenging progressive narratives and different things like that. I've heard everything from that I am secretly someone's plural wife or um, just all sorts of other <laughs> funny, very funny rumors. Um I'm sorry, it's more boring than you think. I'm just a young single adult and a member of the church, and I have some experiences, and I'd like to speak to a little bit of what helped me to stay chaste and stay virtuous that worked for me. When I was young, I don't even remember for sure how it came about or started, but when I was around 12 to 13 years old, I can remember just feeling this calling like from deep within my heart to be loyal to my future husband, that he was real. I remember distinctly feeling, I believe through the spirit that he was real, uh, that he was alive and that I needed to be loyal to him. I needed to be thinking about him. I needed to be preparing and I needed to be true to him both emotionally as well as definitely physically. Physical was an obvious, but uh, for me, the Lord just really seemed to impress on me that my heart mattered and loyalty was important. So I can remember, I think I was about 13 years old because I was in seventh grade and I was going to a Latter-day Saint private school. And we had, uh, it was like a tech lab class one of the days, and I'm sitting there at the computer, and this girl in my class comes over, and she sits down next to me, and she goes, Hannah. So she's like, so, 
who do you have a crush on in the eighth grade? And I don't remember exactly what I said to her. I just remember it was something to the effect of I I told her, well, I don't have a crush on any of the guys in the eighth grade. I haven't even looked at any of them because I'm being true to my future husband right now and I'm not looking at anybody else. And she just thought that was the craziest thing or the weirdest thing (laughs) she had ever heard. And let's just say before that period was over, everyone in the class knew (laughs) what I had said. And they were running to the teacher and they're like, can you believe what Hannah Stoddard said? And she believes in arranged marriages. And I was like, like, not really arranged marriages. I mean, like, okay, yeah, I guess God picks the person you're going to marry. I guess if you call that an arranged marriage, but I, I wasn't saying that. I was just saying, you know, I'm, I don't think I'm going to marry any of those guys in the eighth grade, so I'm not worried about them. I'm thinking about somebody else, and there's only one guy I'm going to marry, and I'm thinking about him. And so, and this wasn't really something that came from my parents. I don't really remember a lot of conversations about this, but it was just something that was just so deep in my soul. I mean, there were sometimes where we would talk as a family about the importance of preparing for marriage one day and and why that was critical. And uh, my dad was definitely a hopeless romantic. So if you've ever seen the movie The Inheritance, uh, which is based, it's loosely based, the movie's really good, it's loosely based on a book by Louisa May Alcott. Um, But there's this scene where the heroine and the hero, who of course end up getting married in the end, spoiler alert, but the first time they meet and they look at each other and it's love at first sight, and my dad would be like, that's them remembering each other from the pre-mortal life. (laughs) I remember that. I remember that so does distinctly. And so there was a little bit um, sometimes of, you know, just those conversations of just remembering, you know, you made covenants before this life. Um, But it was more my own thoughts. I just felt deep within my soul, loyalty is important. And later I found this quote from John Taylor that really resonated with me. President John Taylor was speaking to the women of the church. It's called The Origin and Destiny of Woman. And he told the women, he said, quote, you chose a kindred spirit whom you loved in the spirit world, who had permission to come to this planet and take a tabernacle to be your head, stay husband and protector on earth to exalt you in eternal worlds. All these were arranged. Likewise, the spirits that should tabernacle through your lineage. Thou hast chosen him you loved in the spirit world to be thy companion, end quote. Now, I don't know if this is the case for everyone, if John Taylor was just speaking to those who are aiming for a celestial marriage, Um, but there was something inside of me where I knew from the Spirit that this was the case for me and that I needed to be true to that covenant. Now, I want to be clear as I'm talking about this that I was not anyone special. If I had grown up in a different family, in a different environment, I really think knowing my nature and my personality, I probably would have sunk. And so I have a lot of empathy. I have so much empathy for kids out there um, who struggle. To be honest, I don't know how most kids survive as good as they do when you think about um, the music and the movies, the billboards, everything around us, even even things like the hormones and things that are put in the foods that just mess up emotions and everything. I I think that there are so many that are so amazing for being able to stand their ground and be as strong as they do. Um, and so it wasn't just God working on my heart saying, Hannah, you need to be loyal and you need to be thinking about this. But I was also blessed with an amazing family environment, an environment of just purity where it was easier to be virtuous and to keep those covenants. And the reason why I bring this up is because I think most of our battle right now with helping the youth to keep their standards and to be chaste is the environment. So growing up in our home, we had only the best music. Um, My dad had discovered the teachings of the presidents of the church on rock music when he was a BYU student, and he was someone who had a lot of faith. So even when at first he didn't understand, he, um, he would tell us how at first he thought, this seems extreme, this seems harder then um, I don't understand why they would teach these things, but he went ahead and he cleaned out his music. He acted on faith and faith preceded the miracle and he got his testimony and his witness and his understanding later on. 
Um, but he raised us in that environment with the only the best music, um, only the highest standards of movies. Absolutely no movies with any sex scenes, even if they're cut. My dad would say, if the director put that in there, he's going to be filtering his values through the other scenes as well. We don't want it. We don't want the trash. Um, so only the very best movies. Um, we would watch um, some good movies like uh, one of the adaptations of Sense and Sensibility, the one with Emma Thompson. And my dad would pause all the way through and be like, okay, do you see how we're, she's teaching love versus lust? This is what lust is. This is what love is. This is the difference. And you've got to understand the difference. Um, I grew up in a home where you had to seek out pornography <laughs> to find it. Um, it wasn't shoved in your face. You didn't have anyone bringing it to you. Um, my dad never touched it. So it was just a very, very clean environment. And the power of that is that it gave us as children a taste of goodness. And it left us with a choice. We could, as we grew older and we branched off into our own lives, we could choose. We could keep that goodness or we could you know, exchange it for something different, but at least we had a taste to feel what it felt like. And I fully recognize that a lot of the standards that I grew up with are very unusual and they're very unique, uh, but I really believe that it, it was a significant factor in helping me to not only stay chaste and completely virtuous throughout my entire life, but made it a lot easier. And I really feel like we need to bring this back. Uh, in the portion of Jacob that we're reading this week, in chapter 1, verses 7 through 8, Jacob talks about how he was laboring diligently among his people to try to persuade them to come to Christ. And why come to Christ? He said so that they could partake of the goodness of God. It was all about just experiencing that goodness and peace to enter into his rest, he says. Um, and I love that description because that is really what the gospel is all about. It's about rest. It's about peace. It's about beauty and just complete tranquility. Just it's, per, it's perfect peace. And Jacob talks about how he said he, he tried to persuade the Nephites, don't rebel against God, suffer his cross, bear the shame of the world. That means it's not easy. That doesn't, when we say a, a state of perfect rest, that doesn't mean it's easy, that there's no trials. No, you are suffering Christ's cross. You are bearing the shame of the world, but you have rest and you have been able to taste and partake of the goodness of God. And so many people, when they look at higher standards or they look at um, even things that the presidents of the church have taught, they see restrictions and they see hardship, but they're completely missing the point and they're completely missing the joy and the light and the peace and the goodness. The other thing that was very powerful about our home environment was learning what real love was. And one of the ways that was really effective for that was studying good examples. So for example, we read President Benson's biography and seeing uh, the story of him and his wife, Flora, what that looked like, the dynamic, just we had good, healthy visuals to see what does this look like and how do we uh, build this? Um, my dad absolutely loved Jane Austen's books. Um, this is very separate and very different from how a lot of people see the whole Jane Austen fan community, what it's been turned into. Um, some of the movies are not appropriate. Uh, some of them are amazing. Um, but really back to when I say Jane Austen, I mean the books. I mean her message, which is actually filled with the gospel. She has gospel principles all through them. They're packed. And my dad would love those books and he would tell us to read them and to use them as a tool to understand what real love was. So this leads me to the final point uh, that I really feel is important and was absolutely life-changing for me. And that was coming to understand what real love is. I can remember my dad commenting a lot growing up saying, there is a difference. There's real love and there's this false lust. And there's a difference between the two. But while I felt like I understood him, looking back, I can see I didn't really understand. And it was something that God had to teach me line upon line over time. Now, as I grew older, that feeling of loyalty did grow. I had a dream when I was in my teens and just some different experiences that just impressed on my mind. I want to be true to this and I'm going to keep these covenants like I would die before these covenants were broken. 
I just began watching everything going on around me, um, becoming more aware of the culture and also watching choices that friends were making and watching um, devastation, watching heartbreak after heartbreak after heartbreak. I just remember feeling like this is not what I want. I'm going in opposite direction. I I could see daily uh, what I didn't want to be or be like or become or experience. Um, Seeing the good was harder. And for myself, as I kept seeing over and over what I didn't want, uh, uh, it caused me to run the opposite direction. And in running the opposite direction, how I dealt with that was I just decided just to close the whole subject. I just shut the whole thing down. I even made a decision. I was like, you know what? I'm not going to read any of these books by Jane Austen. I'm not even going to really spend any time watching the movies because I don't want anything that's going to mess me up. And I don't know what the truth is. And so I'm just going to avoid the entire thing. And, you know, that was fine because I was at periods of my life where I had other priorities and everything like that. Um, But my dad and I actually had disagreements over the subject uh, because he kept saying, no, Hannah, like, there, 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 there is a true version. There's, there's nothing wrong with these books. You've got to, embracing the good is not going to put you at risk of being deceived by the counterfeit. Um, the more you actually understand the good and you understand the truth, the more easily you'll be able to resist or uh, turn off a, a false or fake version. And I, and I just didn't understand that. And I had to Over time, God had to work with me and take me through experiences so that I could. And that is a story for another time. But what I will say about it is that it had to be the work of God. And that is one of the things that I think is most important that our youth need to know is that, number one, the only way to understand purity, understand goodness, and understand Um, true attributes of God. And that includes romantic love. That includes, this is part of the gospel. It's part of eternity. It's part of the celestial kingdom. The only way to, to understand that is to have God reveal it to you and that God does speak. And there is a verse that Jacob mentions in his sermon to the Nephites when he's talking about um, chastity and virtue. I, I absolutely love this. He's talking about Jesus Christ and God, but he says how unsearchable are the depths of the mysteries of him, of, of God. It is impossible that man should find out all his ways. So he's saying, there's no way you're going to know God just with your finite mind. He says, no man knoweth of his ways, save it be revealed unto him. Wherefore, brethren, despise not the revelations of God, end quote. This is one of the most life-changing verses in my life. I can bear testimony to this. God has to teach you what real love is. God has to teach you the difference, and it has to be done through revelation. That is something that if there's one thing you take away from this, I want you to remember that God does speak. And he will speak to you and he wants to speak to you. He wants to teach you about his life. And it's not something that will just happen one day in the millennium. You know, one day when we get all those questions answered. No, it can happen today. It happened for all of the prophets. They talked and they walked with God. They had their questions answered. We can have our questions answered as well. So God does speak. He has spoken to me. He can speak to you. And one of the tools that God used to bring me to the point where I was open to having questions and and going down this journey was actually getting into the teachings of Joseph Smith and other prophets. Um, Shortly after my dad passed away, I made a commitment, and I've talked about this story at other times and other places, um, but I made a commitment to really dive deeper into Joseph Smith's teachings. Uh, Because now with my dad being gone and I was in charge of running the Joseph Smith Foundation and a lot of other projects and, and different things in our family, I felt a hefty weight of responsibility. It wasn't enough to have a testimony and clear understanding of, you know, the topics I, I knew and I understood, the topics that were close to me. I, I needed to know more and I needed to be more grounded. And so I turned to Joseph Smith's teachings. I felt like, you know, the Lord said in Doctrine and Covenants 21, he said that if we study Joseph Smith's teachings, the gates of hell will not prevail against us. So I'm going to have faith that this will work and I'm going to dive in. I'm going to, I'm going to learn. 
And Joseph Smith's teachings opened up a new world to me. And I've talked in previous uh, podcasts about studying Joseph Smith's teachings to the Relief Society. And the first time I really did an in-depth study of them, uh, about two years ago, I I remember sitting in, uh, we have like the sun porch. So I'm sitting out there and, I, and I'm reading these teachings and it was as if the spirit began opening things to my understanding that I had never comprehended before, specifically about marriage and about relationships and what real love really was. And sometimes I'll go back to those teachings like, oh, it's all in there. And as I'm reading the teachings, I'm thinking, wait, there was a lot more in here than the than when I read it before, realizing, oh, well, that was the spirit opening things to my mind through the avenue of opening those teachings of the prophets and and all of the teachings, not just Joseph Smith, um, all of the teachings of the presence of the church are packed with so much help and so much support. Um, but those teachings began giving me principles to begin walking on a journey where God wanted to teach me more. And this came through personal experiences, personal circumstances. God began walking me through. Um, It came also through spiritual experiences like dreams and things like that, uh, where God would open something up to me and And it would cause me to pray more and say, okay, God, I don't understand this. I need you to teach me. And he would say, okay, let's talk about it. And the beautiful thing was that as God began teaching me these principles, it wasn't just about teaching me what real love was. He also began uh, teaching me about the endowment, uh, teaching, opening things in the scriptures that I had never seen before. He began healing um, past wrongs that had been done to me by others and had left me hurt and left me broken. And I just began feeling impressions like you cannot live with this. You have used the atonement in your life to repent from all of the mistakes that you have made. Like, good job. Like, check. Like, you've got that one down. But now it's time to heal. The atonement is also about healing and bringing enabling power And it's a journey that I had to walk. It's a very personal journey. It's a journey that sometimes was very hard and at other times required sacrifice and patience, patience to wait, patience to say, okay, God, you've asked me to do this. I'm doing it and I'm going to be patient for the answers to come. And then sometimes the answers would come quicker than I was ready for. And I'm like, wait, whoa, 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 too much, too much. Um, But God does walk with us. And I remember one moment um, where I was sitting there and I could feel God teaching me some of these principles through through the scriptures. And I just remember feeling gratitude and the Lord impressing on me like, Hannah, if you had not taken this as seriously as you had, you would have missed out. Um, So I do believe that having those standards, I do not regret in any way. I do not regret um, living as high of standards as I did. I don't regret it for a minute, but it could have been easier uh, navigating um, just some situations, um, some experiences in my life. It, it could have been easier if I had understood that you need to understand what true love is and use the tools. I believe there are tools to do so. Um, I'm actually a huge huge advocate now of Jane Austen's books. I have been converted um, because I believe they teach what real love is and they help, they would help our youth experience. This is what it feels like so that when they are confronted with the opposite, they'll be able to detect it and recognize it. And we are in a world today where there are very, very, very few examples of what true love is. And we need to help our youth become more I'm surrounded by that. So again, they can recognize the difference. What I learned and can testify to is that there is good, true, holy, romantic love that is a gift of the spirit. God is, it is an attribute of God. God is a husband. There is a celestial romantic side. I don't hear people talk about this too often. And I think we do need to communicate this to our youth. God is a husband. There is pure romantic love that is pure, but it is an attribute of God. And as an attribute of God, it can only be present through the spirit. It can only be present when there is purity and cleanliness 
there is an opposite that is evil, that is corrupt, that is base appetite, that's driven by a devilish, fallen, natural man. Both of these, both the good love and the evil lust, I will call it, they both have physical effects on the body. They are both very real. But one, the good, the true, can only come at the cost of coming to God. You have to fast. You have to pray. You have to repent. You have to walk through experiences and sacrifice with faith, with revelation for God to give that to you. It is a gift. We are not helping our youth by teaching rules and no doctrine because they don't understand why. They don't understand, well, why do you lose the spirit if you indulge in pornography? They don't understand why covenants are sacred, why it matters so deeply. There is doctrine that we can teach them for relationships, for romantic love. No rules are going to give you reward. No rules are going to fill you with joy and love that you cannot express in words only repentance. If we give our children the good, if we help them to experience and or at least set them on the path so they know how to come to experience the good, the bad will be disgusting to them. We're spending all of our time and our resources trying to change everyone's behavior to cut them off or control them from indulging in the bad without realizing if we just fix the root problem, if we help them taste the good, the the, the bad, the opposite will be disgusting to them. And for me, I believe it goes back to we need to restore in our culture an understanding of what love really is on basically every level. Because when I look around me, I can see all of us, everyone is starved for it in basically every relationship at every level in their lives. They're craving anything that will satisfy. So if we can build a better culture, then they will have something to turn to rather than just trying to continually fight all of the corruption and the pollution that is surrounding all of us. And I have talked to more wives and young women than I can count who have cried to me for hours on the phone about broken marriages, about broken covenants, about the effects of pornography and absolutely destroying any hope that they had in their homes. I have seen the heartbreak and I just have this feeling that it's all unnecessary. I remember at around 16 or 17, sitting in our the dining room that our family had and we had these big windows and looking out across Utah Lake, you could see all of Utah Lake um, from this dining room that we had. And I remember just looking out the window and I just had this feeling that God doesn't want us to suffer. And it feels like today we almost have created this culture in this environment where we feel like it's necessary to suffer. Now, I'm not talking about sacrificing for Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about the sacrifices in the scriptures. I'm talking about unnecessary suffering that just comes from the way that we live and this environment that we've created for ourselves, unnecessary suffering as a consequence of our standards. And I really feel like we are so broken as a people and we have so much hurt and so many counterfeits and so many fake versions and just just corruption out there that there is no way that any of us are going to be able to understand this unless we go to God. But God wants to teach us. He wants to teach us what it looks like to be a wife, to be a mother, to be a husband, to be a father what a perfect romantic relationship looks like in his kingdom. And it is different than what the world promotes. But he has something that is so beautiful and it is so good. And the beautiful thing that I have learned about God is his plan is, yes, it's hard and it requires sacrifice, but the despair and the depression and the wandering and the confusion and the heartbreak that in the world we're taught is necessary, is not necessary. God's plan does not include despair. God's plan does not include anxiety. It does not include depression. And he has something better for us. And we can find that better thing if we will turn to him. I know it. I've experienced it for myself. And I know he can do it for every single person listening to this podcast. So as I close out this podcast, I hope there is 
something that I've said today that will be helpful to someone, that will resonate with someone. Um, I'm sure this is very, a little disjointed and not as smooth as most of my other podcasts and presentations out there. This is the very first time I have ever talked about this publicly, and it's very vulnerable for me. I'm going to be honest, so bear patiently with me on that um, because it is something that is so close to my heart and so special and precious. It's something that I've had to gain through sacrifice and gain through um, beautiful experiences and also hard experiences. But to be honest, it has brought me closer to God and understanding who God is and also finding repentance and healing than almost any other area in my life. And so if there's something that I have said that resonates with someone here, I just want to say one thing. If you are someone who has a broken past and you're listening to this and you're thinking, okay, well, this is what I would want, but I come from this or I've committed this sin in my life or I have this in my past, I want you to remember that Jesus Christ can heal anything and you have to have faith in that and put trust in that. I want you to remember the story of Alma the Younger. Alma the Younger, one of the greatest prophets in the Book of Mormon, literally the man who fathered the prophetic line that went through to the coming of Jesus Christ to the Nephites from father to son. The prophetic line was fathered by Alma the Younger who struggled from the text, it seems, in this area, in the area of morality. He overcame. He was changed. God can heal anything. If you even want this, if this resonates with you, this is you. This is who you really are. This is who you were in the pre-mortal life. You just got sucked in by the trash around you, but Jesus can heal anything and you can have a fresh start today, right now. And then second, we need to build a better culture. (laughs) Our kids need to be raised in an environment that is clean and is free and liberating. Why do we have to go through the destruction? Why do we have to destroy our lives and then pull the pieces together? It's unnecessary. Let's start a new culture. Let's start clean where our children can grow up in homes where they don't have to be confronted with the filth that is everywhere, They where they don't have to be broken. And I really feel like the solution is real love. I feel like Jacob even understood this because when you go through Jacob's chapter, he continually warns against the counterfeit of real love. He warns against the false, fake love of riches and power and lust. And that tells me, well, if that's the problem, what's the solution? The solution is the opposite. The solution is real love. The solution is Jesus Christ's love. It is worth fighting for. It's worth praying and fasting for. It's worth sacrificing for. It is the message of the tree of life. When Lehi eats that fruit, he is filled with what? The love of God. I've often thought that if immorality can destroy a nation, as we've seen with the Nephites, as we see around us, if immorality can destroy, virtue has the power to save and defend by darkness and set captives free. So let's start today. Let's build something better starting today, starting right now. Let's build something better for our children and our grandchildren and our posterity. 